Good afternoon, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name is Ros Saunders. I'm the consultant microbiologist who's been working with the Glenfield team since November last year. Familiar with most of you at the LRI as well, but possibly not some of the newer faces. If you need to email me, you need to use my Sunday name, which is Rosalind. The address is on the on the screen. So I was invited by Matt and Eden to give a talk about antimicrobial resistance. I'm not going on to the opportunistic infections because there is far too much already to talk about in terms of antimicrobial resistance. Thought I'd have a look at your curriculum to see what you're meant to know. Um, so these are the themes that I've picked out that that map to the, the talk that I'll do today. The first thing I want to talk about is what what's the big picture? What is antimicrobial resistance? What what does it mean? What's the significance? And then in order to help you guys understand the decisions that we make sometimes, I want to talk about some of the technical issues um, with the testing and how things have changed recently so that you understand what our reports mean and how they are obtained. We'll talk a little bit about resistance mechanisms, but I don't want to go into that a huge amount because it's a very massive and rather dry topic and you can pick that up from textbooks which is probably a better way of learning that. What's important for you guys is to understand what our local epidemiology is so that you know where we're coming from and what informs our empiric antibiotic choices. And then just towards the end we'll look a little bit about some of the newer treatment options that there are for multi-resistant and extremely resistant organisms. So the big picture, this was the um, UK government risk register from 2017 uh, pre COVID where their biggest risk is the pandemic influenza here at the top right, that little symbol. I don't think my point is working actually. Um, and they also talk about emerging infectious diseases. So that would COVID would fit into that category. That's the yellow triangle symbol and animal related diseases. And although they do mention um, antimicrobial resistance in the risk re register, they don't actually try to plot it on their matrix. But if you look at the box in blue, um, they define what they think antimicrobial resistance is, a process whereby the drugs are no longer effective in treating infections caused by microorganisms. And I'm particularly going to focus on bacteria today. And as they correctly say, without effective antibiotics, it makes a lot of the work that we do in hospitals considerably more risky. And there are some areas of the world where things like bone marrow transplants are becoming increasingly impossible because these patients do get infections after their treatment and some of them are becoming difficult or impossible to treat. So in that risk um, assessment, they've got this kind of time frame of expected to increase markedly over the next 20 years. So if we uh, fast forward a couple of years to the next edition of the UK government risk register, you, am I loud enough, Kaz? Thumbs up, good. We've got they're, some speakers now. Excellent, okay, I'll try not to shout then. So they're now seeing this as a considerably bigger threat um, I'll leave you to read the boxes yourself, but they are saying it's actually not a future threat. It's it's here now and affecting our ability to treat illnesses, which I'm sure all of us in working in ITU will have seen. Um, predicted to lead to lots and lots of deaths worldwide every year um, within a few decades, likely to become a bigger killer than cancer. Um, and just gives you some statistics there about how it's increasing. And one thing I wanted to pick up on is um, in this left hand side box that they are actually increasing, according to the government, at a rate of 9% year on year. So it doesn't take very many years of compounding that 9% until we have a very big problem on our hands. So in light of this, um, this risk register in the 2020 edition is not nearly as beautifully drawn, but the um, red circle at the top that represents number 26 which is pandemic so they've correctly identified that pandemics can have a big impact on us and then they've actually for the first time plotted antimicrobial resistance on the government risk register and it's this um, number 27 in the orange circle there um, 
plotted on axis of likelihood of happening in the next year versus impact. Um, so I would say that it's, uh, I'd have put the likelihood greater than that because it's happening currently. So it's not a statistical theoretical possibility like an earthquake or a volcano might be, it's actually happening here and now. So there's your big picture. These infections cause increased mortality, increased morbidity, a longer length of stay. They are difficult to treat. The antibiotics used to treat them might have an increased amount of toxicity and they are also costly, not just the drugs themselves, but the increased length of stay and the complications associated with these infections. So that's why it's significant. Moving forward to the technical information that I think that you all need to know. There have been recent changes in the microbiology laboratory as of February this year, where we have moved more towards the UCAST definition. So UCAST is the European Committee for Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing. And these are the people who um, create the guidelines about how we test, what organisms we test, against which agents and how we interpret the results. So the significant change in the UCAS definitions that occurred recently, we're all familiar with susceptible or sensitive. That means that if you use a standard regimen of a drug, then your infection is likely to have therapeutic success. Doesn't guarantee 100% therapeutic success for a whole bunch of other reasons. And we're also all familiar with resistant high likelihood of therapeutic failure, even if you use a high dose. So susceptible, we can use that, providing that the antibiotic can get to the site of infection. Resistant, we would avoid. The thing that has changed since um, February is the classification of I. So we used to call that intermediate, and in fact, on our reports in UHL, it will still say intermediate, and that is because our technology is so old that we cannot change the wording of that. But actually the I should now stand for increased exposure. So anything that's reported as intermediate, you can still use an antibiotic for, but you have to have an increased dose of the antibiotic. So an example of that would be using the two grams TDS dosing of meropenem or the QDS regimens of tazacin. Um, the other significant change is that, for example, for Haemophilus, um, the classifications are different depending on whether you're using the oral or the IV agent. So you might start seeing some slightly different Haemophilus reports where it says susceptible to IV comoxiclav and intermediate to oral comoxiclav. So that just means that when the patient is ready to step down to the oral, then you have to use a higher dose of the comoxiclav for them. So this is an example of how the reports would have changed in February 2021. So the top example, it's a screen dump from iLab, that would have been previously called a fully sensitive Pseudomonas aeruginosa. They're the six antibiotics that we routinely test. We don't necessarily always report all of those to the clinicians, um, but they're the six that we test on our first line panel. And then after the change, you will now never see keftazidine, cipro or tazacin being sensitive because the UCAST committee decided that actually those antibiotics are only suitable for Pseudomonas if we use the increased dosing regimen. OK, so if if you see these intermediate reports, I hope that will explain to you what's going on and not to worry that suddenly our Pseudomonases are becoming more resistant than they used to be. Obviously, some of them are, but um, this one at the bottom would still be as sensitive as a Pseudomonas can get. So there are a number of ways of testing in the laboratory for sensitivity and resistance. And broadly, they can be divided into phenotypic and genotypic. So phenotypic is what the bug actually does on an agar plate or within a broth. 
So the vast majority of our sensitivity testing is done on agar plates like the top left one, where six discs of different antibiotics with a uniform concentration in each disc goes on an agar plate. The agar plate has been so-called lawned, as in spread out with an organism, um, and then it gets incubated for overnight. And then the next day, a biomedical scientist will look at that, measure the zone sizes, and broadly, if the organism, which is the kind of the yellowy stuff on the plate, if that's growing right up to the disc, then it's definitely resistant. If you've got a big clear zone around the disc, then that's sensitive. And somewhere in between is a cutoff point, which we call the clinical break point. And those break points are different for every single drug bug combination. So some things will have a cutoff of, say, 20 millimetres, some things it might be 30 or whatever. So they all have to be measured and interpreted each time. So this might go some way to explaining why sensitivity testing perhaps happens not quite as rapidly as, as some clinicians would like it to, because we can't make the bugs grow any faster and because it's quite a manual process to interpret those results. The picture at the bottom is called an e-test. That's where there are strips of paper and the, there's a concentration gradient of antibiotic along the strip. So you can see if you look at the top one that you have a, a biggest zone by the top of the strip where the antibiotic concentration is greater. Sorry, it's the other way around. Um, and then you, you look and see where the, the, the elliptical zone intersects with the paper to read off the MIC, which is the minimum inhib inhibitory concentration. That's where the bacteria can't grow in the presence of that concentration of antibiotic. Just skipping forward, the other method is a broth microdilution. So you can see it's quite an involved procedure that you have to get the correct suspension of bacteria in some saline, put, put it into some tiny little wells, incubate it overnight, and then you look the next day to see if it's changed colour, to see if there are bacteria growing there. And again, you can see in the wells which are growing and which are not, and that will give you uh, an MIC. Going back a little bit, the other method of testing for resistance is genotypic. So we can do PCR tests looking for specific genes, and it is possible to do whole genome sequencing. It's not done routinely in many hospital microbiology laboratories because it is you know, extremely expensive per test. An agar plate and a biomedical scientist time costs a few pence or you know, certainly less than a pound per sample. Whereas any PCR test, you're looking at 50 to 100 pounds per sample. So that is one reason why it's not routinely done. The other reason is that a genotype doesn't tell you everything. So you could look for a specific gene for resistance and you might find that gene, but it doesn't tell you what other genes there might be in the sample that might be interacting with that. So that's why um, the TB service um, at Public Health England, they've moved to whole genome sequencing. But in order to do that, there's been a long period where they have tested um, the phenotype and the genotype in parallel so that they can now um, hopefully correctly interpret from the genotype what is likely to be phenotypically sensitive. Okay, so a genotype, it's a quicker way of doing it, but it doesn't give you the whole story. So when you've done all of this testing, um, these are publicly available distributions of sensitivity for different drug bug combinations and you can find these if you're interested on the UCAST website. So this is Tazacin and E. coli and you'll see that there's a, a black distribution of bars there um, at relatively large zone sizes and they are deemed susceptible, whereas the red ones which are below the breakpoint are deemed non-susceptible. So the reason I've got this picture in here is because I want to 
illustrate that sensitivity testing is not an all or nothing. They don't neatly fall into categories of this will definitely work and this will definitely not. You have to put your cutoff somewhere. And that's why those UCAS definitions say things like this is likely to give you therapeutic success or likely to not work. The other way of doing this is um, the small inset diagram is the same information, but provided in terms of the minimal Inhib inhibitory concentration, the MIC rather than the zone size. So in this case, it's the other way on. You, if you have a smaller MIC, the blue distribution there deemed as sensitive, whereas the red ones at the tail end, they're above the breakpoint and are deemed to be um, resistant. So in order to understand mechanisms of resistance, the first thing you have to do is understand the mechanisms of action of antibiotics. So this is a massive topic in itself, which I don't have time to go into. But briefly, this would be a gram positive organism with a lipid bilayer um, with a cell wall outside and then the aqua colour is a capsule. And you can see that the different classes of antibiotics will attack different parts of the organism. And the one I want to perhaps talk about most of all is the cell wall antibiotics because they're the ones that we use most frequently, especially in intensive care. They tend to be sidle antibiotics because if you disrupt the organism from having a good cell wall, then the organism will die. OK, the other thing it's useful to know from here is that the structure of gram positives and gram negative cell walls is different. So a gram negative would have a sandwich of a peptide glycan cell wall between two lipid bilayers. And that's important because they have this outer lipid bilayer and some of the antibiotics can't get in through the outer lipid bilayer. So that's, for example, is why vancomycin will only work against the cell wall of gram positive organisms because it's a large molecule and can't get in through the outer lipid bilayer of a gram negative organism. There are many different types of resistance. So intrinsic, we've just mentioned the example of vancomycin not being able to access the cell wall of a gram negative. But the ones that are significant from an ITU perspective are the acquired types of resistance. So you can either have point mutations in a bacterium that then gets selected for with treatment, or you can transfer genetic material between different bacteria via a number of different methods. Either a bug dies, releases free DNA into the environment and then it's picked up by another bug, or you can have a phage which transfers bacterial DNA between one organism or another, or they can actually mate called conjugation. And that's the one that's really of significance because many resistance genes are carried on these um, little rings of information of, of genetic material called plasmids and they can transfer between different bacteria and even between different species and they're the ones that are particularly significant for um, in into hospital spread of resistance and briefly there are as many resistance mechanisms as there are mechanisms of actions of the antibiotics so the chief ones are you stop the antibiotic from getting into the cell or you pump it out as soon as it's got in. Or you can in inactivate the antibiotic by producing an enzyme that breaks it down or changes its action. You can change the target so the antibiotic can't bind or you can find an alternative way to do your metabolic pathway or to produce your cell wall. So they're the different resistance mechanisms that can occur. So just as an example, these um, are a set of antibiotics called beta lactams and the beta lactam is this four membered ring. And they, all of these classes have that as the, the common feature. The picture in the middle is the cell wall precursor and you can see at a glance that there is a kind of superficial similarity in the shape of the beta lactam antibiotics and the cell wall precursor. So what happens 
normally is that the cell wall precursors have to be cross-linked by transpeptidase enzymes to make a, a good structure of the cell wall. What happens is that the penicillins and related antibiotics bind onto those enzymes that would normally do the cross-linking and they present, prevent those enzymes from working. So there's a number of different ways in which penicillins can end up with resistance. So one is if you change the target enzyme, the transpeptidase enzymes, they're sometimes known as penicillin binding proteins because that's what they are, they proteins that will bind the penicillin. If they change in structure, then you might find that your particular beta-lactam antibiotic won't bind onto it. So that example would be, um, for example, Staph aureus becoming resistant to flucloxacillin. It does that by changing its penicillin binding protein with a gene called MEK-A. The other way of becoming resistant is that you might be able to not get your penicillin in through the lipid bilayer. So they are often transported in through porins. And if you change the structure of the porin, then the antibiotic can't get in to especially gram negatives to the area where it needs to act on the cell wall. And then the third one, which again is more significant for hospital resistance, is the hydrolyzation of this beta-lactam ring, which inactivates the antibiotics. And that's what I'll be talking about mostly for the rest of the talk. So these enzymes are called beta-lactamases, and they, there are very, very many of them, and they fall into these different classes um, and the classes are based, are based on the, the structure of those enzymes. So there are some here that you will have heard of and some that you may not have. Um, just want to highlight the ESBLs because that's the one that's of relevance to the um, journal paper that you'll be talking about shortly. And the OXA48 ones because they're the ones that are epidemiologically common in NASTA. So all you need to know from here really is that there are many different types and that the different types will inactivate different antibiotics. OK, so here you can see that ESBLs generally inactivate most of your cephalosporins, but yet they might still be OK if you've got a beta-lactamase inhibitor like tazobactam, and they're OK with carbapenems. But you will also see that some of the other Sorry, my phone's ringing. Excuse me. It's Dr. Lim. I have to put her off. So the carbapenemase will inactivate the cephalosporins as well as the, the carbapenems. So this is why in UHL we screen for these. So we screen for what we call the big five um, that are in the image at the top and what we like to see is that these things are not detected by PCR. However, having that test all coming back negative doesn't mean that you are completely in the clear because there are a whole mass of other enzymes that we don't routinely test for because they are not common. So occasionally if we get a very resistant organism and our local PCR test is negative, we will send that away to a reference laboratory and they will look for other genes that associated with carbapenemases. Just a little word about terminology. The ones that we're worried about from an infection prevention point of view are CPEs, which are carbapenemase producing enterobacterialis. So enterobacterialis are things like E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, um, and carbapenemases are these enzymes. In Leicester, we took a decision to just call them CRO because it's easier to say and it's easier to understand. It's a carbapenem resistant organism. But for anybody reading the literature, they don't mean exactly the same thing. So you can have a carbapenem resistant organism, for example, a pseudomonas, that neither produces a carbapenemase and is not an enterobacterialis. OK, so just something to be a little bit careful of if you're struggling to understand something in the literature and it doesn't make sense. Here is a map of the world, which is probably quite small, but the um, what I wanted to illustrate from this is the 
dark coloured in dots are where carbapenemases are endemic, particular carbapenemases. The five that they're showing on this graph are the big five that we test for in Leicester. And what I want you to pick up from here is that in the Americas, one called KPC, Klebsiella pneumoniae carbapenemase, is endemic. In Indochina, NDM, New Delhi metallo lactamase is endemic. But there are some areas of Europe as well, notably Italy and Greece, where there are other carbapenemases that are endemic. Elsewhere, we've got either sporadic cases or small outbreaks, or small to large outbreaks. The next series of maps come from the European EASnet site, which is European Antimicrobial Resistance it's surveillance. This is E. coli resistance to carbapenem, so less than 1% for most of Europe. Looks quite encouraging. When you get onto Klebsiella pneumoniae, you end up with some places, notably southern and eastern Europe, where the percentage of resistant organisms, these are all blood cultures or um, CSF, but in, in the main they would be blood cultures you'll see that more Klebsiella's are resistant. Looking at Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, it's more common in the UK for these to be resistant to meropenem. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're producing a carbapenemase because there are other mechanisms that can make Pseudomonas resistant to meropenem. And again, you can just see at a glance where the areas are that have got problems with resistance. The other organism that you need to be aware of that we haven't had significant problems with in Leicester yet, but has caused outbreaks in ITUs is Acinetobacter, which is a low virulence organism, but can cause problems in immunocompromised and ITU patients um, and has caused ITU outbreaks. It's very hardy and it survives in the environment for a long time. In the UK, we don't have a massive problem with carbapenem resistance in these organisms, but in a lot of the rest of Europe, then there are significant problems with this organism. So this is one that we need to um, be horizon scanning for and be very vigilant about, especially if we have any repatriations from those areas. So looking at the local epidemiology in Leicester, by far our most common type of Carbapenemase is the OXA48, um, most commonly found in Klebsiella, but also in E. coli and other organisms. And a typical sensitivity pattern for this organism would look like the Klebsiella pneumoniae that I've listed below. So you can see that we do still have a number of fairly sensible treatment options available for these organisms. We'll tend to use ciprofloxacin or keftazidime or keftazidime avibactam. You'll also see that it's sensitive phenotypically to meropenem. And one thing I wanted to highlight is that um, normally we hide the meropenem from reports because we don't want people to use meropenem for these organisms, because although it might be phenotypically sensitive according to the breakpoints, um, in vitro and in vivo sensitivity is not necessarily the same. So you can have something that tests sensitive on a plate but doesn't work in the patient. So it's it's all rather complicated from that point of view. And that's why, especially in the ITU patients, the microbiologists will try to guide you towards the correct treatment. The reason that we have lots of OXA 48s in Leicester um, may relate to an outbreak that we had at the LRI site in the summer and autumn of 2018. So this was first picked up with a geriatric inpatient who had a Klebsiella that looked very resistant from a urine culture. Um, it was intermediate testing to meropenem, but resistant to ertapenem, so got some more testing, was PCR tested and found to be an OXA48. Um, and that raised alarm bells because this particular patient hadn't been hospitalised outside of Leicester and didn't have a travel history to any of the places where he might have brought it in from. So there was a strong suspicion that this had been acquired on the ward um, and it was looked into more closely. So initially, um, 
the whole ward was screened to find out what was going on. And I just want to say, uh, acknowledge Felicia Lim for this information. This is this outbreak's all been written up and and published. If anyone wants to read more about it, speak to Felicia. So. On screening, we found further cases and there were some more clinical cases that popped up. So they were all either isolated or eventually cohorted because there were rather too many of them for the number of side rooms that we had at the Royal site. Outbreak was declared and ultimately we screened all of the medical wards at the LRI site, which was about 900 patients. And we found 90 cases that were positive for OXA 48 over 12 wards. Most of them were Klebsiella's, but some of them were other organisms, notably E. coli. So all of these went off for typing um, with a particular sort of typing called VNTR, which is variable number of tandem repeats. Um, and they actually found multiple strains. Um, and they, the working hypothesis is actually that the resistance gene, the OXA48 gene, may have spread between different organisms on a plasmid. And if you VNTR type, you might be comparing a Klebsiella with an E. coli or something. So it wouldn't be surprising if there were different VNTR type. What you actually need to do is to sequence the plasmid um, from those organisms and compare that. It's like if you look at a bunch of cakes and you might look at the icing on the surface, but actually what you need to do is see what the filling is and Perhaps the VNTR typing wasn't actually looking at the correct, um, the correct thing. Ultimately, the working hypothesis is that there had been a patient repatriated from Spain on the index ward um, a short period before the outbreak was identified. So there's a suspicion that this patient might have brought it to the trust via that route. Um, this patient. I think ended up in a care home and subsequently did test positive for OXA 48. So it doesn't prove that that patient was the index, but may well have been. But the outcome of all of this is that there is a cohort of people who were in hospital at the time and have been, um, because it was largely geriatric, they have gone into care homes within the Leicester and Leicestershire region carrying these organisms. And the other thing I want to say is that once you have tested positive this organism, you are considered colonised um, indefinitely. There's still a lot of research being done about how quickly people lose um, colonisation of these organisms, but it's, it's not really very clear at the moment. So for an infection prevention point of view, we always consider these patients positive going forward. So PHA put out a document last year saying what we should do if we have um, carbapenemase producing Enterobacteriaceae. So it's, it's fairly standard stuff. It's admission screening, rapid detection, good infection prevention, um, cleaning, decontamination, antimicrobial stewardship, um, good laboratory practice, recognising outbreaks and all of the senior support that goes with this. And the good news is that Leicester were already doing this um, a couple of years ago with the I-5 um, infection prevention assessment tool where we are looking quite hard for these cases. So we particularly screen anybody who's been hospitalised outside of Leicester and anybody who's especially been hospitalised um, abroad. If they're high risk, we isolate them, we investigate them with rectal screens, we initiate treatment if they are clinically infected and inform is informing the infection prevention team. So a few little cases. Uh, this patient had a rectal swab had been repatriated from Greece. So have a think about what you think they might have found. And uh, this is what was on their crow screen. So they had three different carbapenemase producing genes. Luckily, because um, the question had been asked, they were in a side room already. So when we get a Crow PCR positive, what we then do is go back to the sample and try to culture it to see what we grow, because you can't do sensitivity testing using PCR. You have to use a phenotypic method for that. So we identified a Klebsiella pneumoniae and we tested it for a whole bunch of antibiotics. 
and it's resistant to pretty much all of them with just a, a few things that you might want to consider using, but which are not suitable for all patients or for all sites of infection. So this is a, a pretty problematic organism. I think you'll agree. Another case, this patient was um, admitted to hospital in Ecuador. Um, they came back to Leicester with a KPC gene on board. So this is the one, if you recall, I said is endemic in North America and South America also. And you can see that there's a few more treatment options that you may have heard of for those, but all of the routine things are no-go areas should this patient have needed treatment. And then a third case, which is a NDM, this is the one that um, is endemic in Indochina. You see again, it's a Klebsiella pneumoniae. So it seems to be Klebsiellas that pick up these genes more readily or that, that are the problematic organisms. And again, you can see that it's resistant to a whole bunch of antibiotics, including some that some people might not have heard of or not be familiar with, and that treatment options are limited. So just to finish up, I want to talk about when treatment is required. So if a patient comes into hospital, they've come for, I don't know, cardiac surgery and they have a positive crow screen, they're isolated. Do they need treatment for that rectal carriage? And the answer is no, on the whole. So all of us carry a whole range of organisms in our gut. So our poo is approximately 50% bacteria by weight. Um, and we are all going to carry something. But if it's not causing the patient any problems at that time, we do not need to treat it. This is colonisation rather than infection. Now, if that patient subsequently developed a urinary tract infection or an abdominal collection, then we probably would want to cover the organism that we had found in their rectal screen, especially if they were not doing very well. So the screens themselves don't need treating, but clinical specimens do. And any patient that's got a positive crow screen it should be flagged with an XDR flag in the infection prevention set, set uh, area of nerve centre. So one take home message is if you've got any patient who's XDR flagged on nerve centre and they are looking septic, you're probably best to discuss them with a microbiologist rather than just starting meropenem because meropenem is unlikely to be the appropriate empirical agent for a patient who has an XDR flag. And just finish up, there are a whole bunch of less familiar antibiotics, some of which are not yet licensed in the UK. So I know on the Glenfield ITU, we have used Keftazidine Avibactam for a resistant pseudomonas in the last few months. Um, Imipenem Silostatin Melibactam is also one that you can use for multi-resistant pseudomonases. And there are a whole bunch of new cephalosporins, some of which can be used for MRSA and some of which can be used for multiply resistant gram negatives. There are a lot of buts though. Um, these agents are generally very expensive, by which I mean roughly, say, £100 a dose rather than the, say, £10 a dose that Tazacin might be or £1 a dose that amoxicillin might be. Um, some of them are difficult to get hold of. So, for example, the one at the bottom, the keftolazine tazabactam um, has had a global shortage in recent months, so just we can't use it. And then there are some other classes of antibiotics. So a quinolone for ABSSI is acute bacterial skin, skin structure infection, notably with MRSA. There's a couple of new broad spectrum tetracyclines which don't have a license in the UK yet. And plasamycin is an amy aminoglycoside related to gentamicin, but it um, can evade some of the aminoglycoside degradation enzymes that can cause problems with gent resistant. So there's a whole bunch of new antibiotics that are on the horizon and potentially available to be used, um, but we don't have very much experience with many of these antibiotics yet. Um, so all of these are going to need discussing on a case by case basis. 
There's a couple that I wanted to mention. So Zavikefta, because it's first line for OXA48 infections, um, the licenses as listed there. It's also active against some um, marrow resistant pseudomonases and KPC carbapenemase as well. One thing that I do want to say about that is that we prescribe this by trade name because when we started using it as keftazidine avibactam, because we always like to prescribe generically, um, it did cause quite a lot of confusion. So people wrote down the word that they recognised, which was keftazidine, and didn't necessarily write down the avibactam bit because they'd never heard of it. Um, the other thing is that it can be confusing in terms of the vials. So if you just look at the first word on the vial, it's possible to file the keftazidine avibactam in with the keftazidine and cause confusion like that. So in order to avoid that confusion, we decided it was probably safer to prescribe by brand name rather than generic name. Um, and just going back a little bit, I suspect that we may have to do the same if we uh, ever prescribe things like the imipenem salistatin melobactam, because it's a bit of a mouthful. I can't imagine anybody wanting to write that down on a drug chart um, and the potential for error is, is there. The other new antibiotic which I know has been used is quite difficult to get hold of and requires a lot of paperwork, I think including a blue tech form for authorization because it's quite costly, is Kefidericol. So this is a Kefalosporin with a different mode of action. It's got a catechol moiety on it which binds iron and it tricks the bacteria into thinking that it's got iron that the bacteria need to grow um, and then it gets taken up as a sidera for, and in order to do that, um, it can bypass the porins that antibiotics normally need to get into cells. So it, it tricks the um, bacterium. It's considered to be a Trojan horse antibiotic. And once it's there, it's reasonably resistant to hydrolysis by the majority of the ambler carbapenemases as well. So it's one that does have potential once we've exhausted other options for treating these antibiotics, with these infections, sorry. So take home messages from today. The main thing is I want you to understand that I or intermediate actually means susceptible, but you just need to increase the exposure. There are a lot of new drugs coming out and you have to be particularly careful of these compound drug names and make sure that it's very clear what you're prescribing. In terms of um, infection prevention, prevention always better than cure and if we can do everything in our means to slow down the spread of these multi-resistant organisms that will be marvellous. So make sure that we always do the basics well and correctly and also for repatriations especially from abroad um, be very very cautious because a lot of these organisms are being brought in, not just from abroad, but hospitals outside of Leicester. So we know that we have an Oxford 48 issue or did do, but other hospitals around the UK might have problems with different organisms. So don't don't assume that just because your patients from 50 miles away that their epidemiology will be the same as Leicester because it's not necessarily true. Um, I think we've seen this a little bit with the, the COVID mutual aid that actually we've been relatively lucky certainly at the Glenfield ITU not to have imported um, too many horribly resistant gram negatives. We've had a couple of MRSAs I think imported um, and it may be because the patient population who are fit for ITU care with COVID possibly haven't had very much communication with their hospitals in their local area so I think so far, touch wood, we've not had it too bad, but um, always worth in your referrals for the mutual aid if if it happens again to make sure that we have a good travel and hospitalisation history so that we know whether these patients are at risk or not. OK, that's all I've got for you for today. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions or you can email them to me later if you need to get on to the next part. Thanks, Roz, that was great. Does anyone have any questions 
Kaz is moving. I've got a question. Roz, have we ever like tested healthcare workers? Because I hate to think what multi-drug resistant bugs we all carry. Yeah, if you look at the PHE document, um, the 2021, I can perhaps find a link to it and put it in the, the chat. Um, it just suggests that we shouldn't be testing healthcare workers because the problem is what do you do with that information once you find it? Um, so in theory, if we all wash our hands when we go to the toilet, even if you are colonised with um, multi resistant gram negatives, you shouldn't be transmitting them to the patient. So there have been um, some staff screenings for MRSA, for example, when you um, can't seem to get on top of an outbreak. This is not necessarily Leicester, but nationally. Um, and that's slightly different because we all shed skin squames, whether we have good hand hygiene or not. So if you do have someone with MRSA that you can then attempt suppression uh, and try and dampen down an outbreak that way. But with healthcare workers, it's a lot more tricky because you can't decontaminate their gut. So it's, it's quite tricky and also you don't want to ban a healthcare worker from working because in theory there's no need to because if they wash their hands properly, it should all be fine. So it's an absolute can of worms. So for that reason, um, screening of healthcare workers is not routine. So wash your hands. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Any other questions for Rod? No. Nope. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that again, Rod. It was really, really good, really useful. You're welcome. Anytime. Um, I've got to go and uh, pick up from school shortly, so I'm going to miss the Merino bit, but I just want to put my comment in at the beginning that um, if anyone's interested in how it translates into practice, you might want to look at the IDSA guidelines for the treatment of um, multi resistant organisms because they have uh, their interpretation of what the Merino trial means. Cool. OK, thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kaya. I'm one of the Doctors currently working in AICU in Glenfield. I'm going to talk about the Merino trial, what it's called, which is the effect of fipiracillin, I'm sorry, Tazobactam versus meropenem of 30 day mortality for patients with E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia, bloodstream infection, and uh, contraction resistance. Uh, I must admit, it's a difficult study for me to interpret it. Uh, it's a non-inferior study and with quite complex analysis and lots of subgroups, but I hope I can present it in a decent manner. I think Eden sent you all an email which um, which has got the study, so I recommend you to read it through and maybe we could have a discussion, but let's start. So why it's important, I think, following our um, Dr. Sanders um, discussion on the um, gram negative bacteria and the production of the uh, beta lactamase um, and actually um, the beta lactamase uh, enzymes which is a global public health concern uh, as it was mentioned before it's treated usually with carbapenems uh, so what we are heading to is carbapenem resistance so the idea behind this study is actually to have a look if actually piperacillin and tazobactam uh, may have a effective um, carbapenem sparing. And uh, there are some studies in the past, but, uh, but they were mostly observational study and the results was, were un un unconclusive. So objective of this study is actually to determine whether therapy with a Piperacin and tazobactam is non-inferior to meropenem, and that non-inferior is actually the significant part of the study. And what we are looking into is, is the patient with the bloodstream infection, which are caused by the keftraxin, non-susceptible E. coli and uh, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia. I think after the lecture, uh, the microbiology lecture, the fantastic lecture we had, I think it makes much more sense, which is great. So design, design, let's start with the design of the study. Uh, so the study was designed by the um, 
Australasian uh, Society for Infection Disease and Clinical Research Network. So what it was is a non-inferior parallel group open later, uh, label uh, randomized study, which was across 20, 26 uh, sites in nine countries between February 2014 up to July 2017. Uh, these are the um, inclusion criteria. So, uh, of course, it has to be, um, it included the adult ho uh, hospitalized patient, adult men more than the age of 18, more than 21 in uh, Singapore. Uh, the primary treating physician had to agree to the to enroll to the study. That means that we had to randomize the doctors as well. Uh, they had to have one positive blood, blood culture for E. coli or Klebsiella pneumonia, which are non susceptible to uh, uh, keftazoxin or kefataxin. The randomization trial, which is also important, was within 72 hours from the positive blood culture. And on the other side, the exclusion criteria, the usual pregnancy and breastfeeding, of course, allergy, uh, the treatment uh, without curative intent, um, the uh, requirements uh, of extra antibiotics, antimicrobials uh, to treat the gram negative uh, bacilli. If when we don't expect patient to survive uh, more than 96 hours and previous enrollment in, in the trial. So in terms of the um, uh, study uh, population certification and randomization, so as I mentioned before, 26 hospital, nine countries, and that's the period. So um, the patients were stratified uh, from the microbiology point of view into the infective species and uh, separate from the E. coli uh, and Klebsiella pneumonia. Uh, they were specified into how virulent they are and how severe infection they cause. And uh, the second part is, uh, uh, the last part is the severity of this disease. They use something which is called a um, uh, PIT score. Uh, it, PIT score is a um, microbiology uh, type of uh, scoring system which shows how severe the response, uh, the infection is. And uh, we are talking about the score more than four and also um, uh, high risk infection, which is for those organisms would be non uh, urinary tract infection. The patients were subsequently randomized uh, into the uh, type of 101 allocation into two limbs. One when they were treated with meropenem and the other which is uh, which we are treated with the piperacillin uh, tazobactam. Uh, they use a red cam system to make it to make it even. They divided it into the groups of two or fours and they allocated it um, uh, to the appropriate arms. So this is how the intervention looked like. So you had the positive blood cultures in the lab. Uh, the um, study team arrived. The treating physician was randomized to the trial and uh, then subsequently the patient was randomized to one of those two limbs. It could be tazosin 4.5 grams, uh, six hourly IV or meropenem one gram, uh, one gram, eight hourly uh, intravenous. It was specific that the infusion had to be for 30 minutes and also uh, the treatment could be between four to the to 14 days. Um, subsequently, there were uh, there were other interventions, which is uh, blood culture at day three after randomization or if the patient was febrile, the uh, febrile was established, um, temperature was um, Pyrexia was established as temperature more than 38 degrees and every time they spike temperature for the period to up to five days um, after randomization. On top of that, there was extensive baseline data um, collected and it was um, um, clinical and demo uh, demographical data. And also because the study started uh, up to 72 hours, the patients were randomized from the positive blood culture. So lots of those patients, of course, went on the different antibiotics. So they also included that in their review. Um, on the other hand, when the patient was randomized into the study, they had a detailed, uh, they, they had uh, records that um, the data was recorded on a daily basis for the five days. After five days, the decision was left for the team, the treating uh, clinician, in terms of they could step down the patient to the other antibiotics or co continue the allocated um, uh, agent or if patient massively improved, just stop the treatment. In terms of the follow-up, uh, they had 30 days after um, randomization 
and if patient was discharged home, it was follow up with a telephone phone call. So it was quite robust and quite a well organized study. Uh, moving on, uh, the measurable outcomes was the primary, was the old outcomes of mortality at 30 days after randomization. However, there was lots of secondary outcome that they looked uh, into it. So uh, time to the clinical and microbiological resolution of the infection, and there were specific criteria for each of those. Clinical and microbiological success at day four of the of randomization, microbiological uh, resolution, and a relapse of the bloodstream infection and secondary infection, and that was more into details in terms of the microbiology part of the research um, from uh, from the from from the lab team. Oh gosh, the slides are unaligned. Um, however, so there was extensive microbiological studies. Um, it was at, uh, the patients were informed that the bacteria which were isolated, they were subsequently went through the genetic testing. They had there have been a uh, sequence. Uh, they were also um, tested as per UCAST with the minimum uh, inhibitory. The MIC was established, established, and also they had the ESBL uh, conf uh, was confirmed by the disk testing by uh, Clavlet. <laughs> So carry on. Um, in terms of the sample calculation, so this is quite interesting because um, there was never a trial similar to that. So what they've done is they were, uh, in the past there was an observation study that looked at the mortality, fatty day mortality with um, carbapenem, which was established for 16.7%. For so based on that, uh, they um, assumed that if they collect 454 patients, uh, they can actually find a non-inferior margin of 5% of, and with the power of um, 80%. The 5% non-inferiority margin was agreed then between the different specialities that participate actually in that trial. So we are talking critical care, infectious diseases, and also the uh, Australasian uh, Society for Infectious Disease and Research Network. Statistical analysis was quite complex, so the primary outcome is pretty straightforward. So it's the uh, primary outcome, as mentioned before, uh, was defined as the correct randomized patient, which means the patient had a positive blood culture, went through the randomization process and subsequently uh, and subsequently was discharged or followed up at 30 days. Um, and um, it was compared to the between between the tazosin and the meropenem group. On top of that, they also supported this analysis with something that is quite, at least from my point of view, quite complex, which is per protocol population. So how I understand it is, they actually um, they look at this ideal population which went through the through the process and they compare it the outcome to the meropenem. So it's quite in detail um, uh, reference study. In terms of the secondary outcomes, that was more pretty, that was much more um, easy to analyze. So they use different uh, parametric and non-parametric tested depending on the type of the spread they achieved. And uh, all that, all that uh, secondary finding were divided into five groups, which are as, as listed. They try to compare urinary versus non-urinary infection, PIT score more or less for, so how severe, so how severe the infection is, E. coli versus pseudomonas, um, appropriate and inappropriate empirical treatment, so they look a bit on the treatment before the randomization, and they also look at the healthcare association versus non-healthcare association infections. So there's a loads of data been actually brought up into this study. So this study was monitored. Um, it was monitored with the data and safety monitoring board, which consisted of two independent infectious disease physician and independent statistician. So what they decided is that they're going to follow the patients at three stages, at 50, 150 and 340 patients. Which, which finished their 30 uh, day follow up period. So they finished actually the study. They dropped the rule that uh, it has to them uh, non inferiority of 
it doesn't look very. I hope that it looks a bit better than this. But overall, so this is this is where the. I mean, this is where where they represent the, the actually the issue of the study. So they actually enrolled 1,646 patients, of which only 391 was randomized for the for the for the, uh, for the study, uh, and some of them uh, a quite large number. Sorry, Quite large chunk didn't meet the uh, criteria. 218 uh, declined, and 123 the declined the arm, which is actually the physician who was treating the patient, declined for the patient to participate in the particular part of the study. So overall, we finished with 196 patients in the each arm, so, so we've got equal spread, but subsequently some of them uh, were withdrawn, some of them uh, didn't uh, didn't attend the follow ups. So we have 188 versus 191. And that's the number that just carries on through the, through the study. So in terms of patient characteristics, as, as you can see, there's uh, the tables are quite busy, however, Overall is 50 50 spread between all those characteristics. Uh, the only thing I think that's worth to mention that in the meropenem limbs so of the one with the 191 uh, patients, we have a higher uh, amount of the urinary tract infection, higher apache score, and a higher risk of diabetes. Probably this is just a random number. Uh, however, in terms of the tazosid, so piperacid in tazobactam group, we've got more immunocompromised uh, patients, and also they receive the they receive the time from uh, recognition of infection to actually give antibiotics is much shorter. This is quite interesting because it's almost a double, it's 5.5 versus 9.6. Right. So the results, and this is where the trouble epic starts. So when the board reviewed 340 patients, what they realized is that there was a difference in between the outcomes. So um, what what uh, what what they uh, realized that actually the mortality in the tazosin group was a significantly higher than in the meropenem group. The study subsequently was uh, uh, suspended temporarily. Uh, on the uh, in uh, July 2017, um, where they had 391 patients pending 30-day mortality, 30-day uh, uh, follow-up. Uh, they also concluded that uh, the, uh, that it's highly unlikely to actually demonstrate demonstrate the non-inferiority of the piperacillin tazobactam versus uh, meropenem. But the study committee themselves decided to terminate the study on the 10th of August uh, in 2017, and that was independent from the from the board review. So the outcomes. Uh, so on the on the piperacillin tazobactam limb, we had a mortality of 12.3 percent, which is 23 patients, 187. On the meropenem, meropenem side, is seven of 191, which is 3.7 percent. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the results were consistent with the PP population review and also significant difference. Oh, now, secondary outcome, as we know, they divide, they collected loads of data and they divide it into multiple groups and they try to analyze this. But I know that it actually looked at the, uh, so starting with those false points, the clinical and microbiological um, resolution in terms of the significance in the microbiological resolution they for the patient uh, in terms of detection of the less subsequent detection of the carbapenem resistant organism and the secondary outcomes those actually they were insignificant so despite all this robust data collection and even when we are looking at the risk associated with randomization into the both limbs, it's actually it favors meropenem, which is which is really really interesting. Oh, uh, I looked into adverse effects. Uh, the fatal looked at the list actually. There were a couple of listed, but there none of them actually related to the drugs. There were mostly septic patients uh, who were looking at the review. They had advanced cancer or they were uh, of the elderly age. 
Um, and in terms of the uh, significant events, uh, there were five, or, so 2.7 percent for the uh, piperacillin in plazobactam and 1.6 uh, percent for uh, meropenem, and it included things like uh, infected line or complication from uh, insertion peak lines, etc. So it's again not directly related to the drugs that were used. So. Um, in terms of the microbiology, so there's uh, loads of things that actually were discussed during um, uh, during the during Ross. Um, sorry, I'm losing my voice during uh, Ross uh, Ross's uh, presentation. So I strongly suggest uh, to have it have it looked through because about this uh, oxygenotypes is actually a entire paragraph. Um, when I was reviewing it first time, I just didn't grasp the importance of it. So I strongly suggest to have a look at the study itself. But overall, they collected quite a lot of cultures uh, from the patients which were suitable for the microbiologist analysis. Um, there were a couple of them which were non susceptible to the papyrusillid tazobactam, which are of course excluded. And most of them were susceptible to the meropenem. Uh, and they also confirmed that 86% uh, were or the, the of them were uh, phenotypically ESBL. And I think that it was quite cool because they actually done the genetic um, sequence for all those bacteria, and that's how they establish actually in details uh, those uh, enzymes which are involved in the resistance for those antibiotics. So the discussion itself, so as I mentioned, they um, they divided that into the, all those five groups in terms of the UTI and non-UTI and actually there was again no significant difference between the limbs. So discussion. First of all, they showed that the um, non-inferiority could not be demonstrated from that study. However, what they've noticed is that actually mortality was lower than expected. And the question arises because there is that, uh, that um, during the randomization process, we have if the patient is not expected to survive, or we are not expecting patient uh, to have a, we are not treating them with, in terms of the curative purpose. Has that have significant influence on the study? And also the decision of the clinician, that's another thing that I think is important in, uh, in, um, um, in, this, um, in this study. Um, oh, limitation, a lot. And they, I think what is nice about this paper that they actually admit their, uh, their limitations. Um, as mentioned that um, there's always a delay between taking blood cultures and getting the result. The patient has been probably on multiple antibiotics. It is quite likely possible that they might have been have meropenem and then subsequently they were uh, assigned to the tazosin limb and opposite can happen. So there's loads of contamination. Uh, Interestingly, when there was a step down uh, therapy on day five, when the physician could actually choose the antibiotic, frequently it was meropen, uh, so it, sorry, it was carbapenem. Um, so um, they also there's, despite the fact that they collected quite a lot of details about the study, uh, there's not much about the adequate control of the infection that wasn't explored. So has that actually in, in, um, influenced uh, mortality? And uh, the study wasn't blinded, of course. So the personal feeling of the physician who was randomized, uh, who, who was randomized initially before they randomized the patient, uh, uh, had a significant influence. And also, if you are looking on the cascade of actually randomization, this is a large dropout. And something uh, that I mentioned that this number 123, which was basically physician choice not to al align this person for the particular limb. In terms of strength, it was quite difficult to me to find strength of the study. I think that uh, the study was published. OK, it was a study that didn't actually show positive outcome, but it was published. And I think that's really important. They openly admit to the issues that they had. And I think uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, quite a valid point. Uh, it was designed appropriately for the non-inferior study. It was multi-centered, multi 26 centers. 
that's uh, uh, that's uh, significant and uh, they ask the relevant questions. So how can we prevent creation of the carbapenem uh, resistant ESBL? So, but overall, the conclusion is that amongst the patient with E. coli and pneumonia, bloodstream infection and uh, ceftriaxone resistance, uh, definitive treatment with piperacillin and tazobactam compared with meropenem did not result in non-inferior third-day mortality. So they do, do, do not support of using piperacillin tazobactam in the setting. And lastly, uh, this is in the nutshell, just the last slide. Any questions? Oh, it's a difficult one. I would call it microbiologist for okay. advice. Because I think it's 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 very challenging. I mean, they actually um it's quite interesting both times because I expected any some sort of uh, maybe allergic reaction that would be, you know, uh, recorded in the in the study that involves drug, but there was none of them. So I suspect it it depends what I see was the infection coming from, but definitely from from call to the microbiologist, especially if I suspect that is a it it possibly it could be ESBL. So it's clinical judgment. That's my call. Hello. What are the use of penicillin use? Six hours or eight hours? I think they use uh, TDS. Yeah. Yeah, meropenem was tedious. There is a, there is actually a variation in between using tazosin. Um, they mentioned that actually, if you look at the spread, there are like two cases from Canada, actually, just random. Um, but what they actually, um, I think they wanted to have. There was mentioning something I was listening during the uh, of the presentation that there was something to mention that, that there's some endemic type of ASBL in states. I think they tried actually to go that route, however, they didn't manage. And the doses of tazosin in um, in America as well they are different. I think they've got like three point seventy five as well. So they mentioned that in 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 this in this paper as well, which is quite interesting. Any other questions? If I can answer them. Just about the patient selection. So you had to have like uh, the ESPL bacteremia to be included. Yeah, that's but correct. They didn't. But then I suppose the more severely your patient were excluded, the patient were expected to survive. Yes. That's, I suppose that's sort of undermining antibiotics as a potentially life saving intervention. I mean, just because you don't expect your patient to survive and you put them on the palliative care, at least that's how I interpret it, OK? doesn't mean that they don't receive the antibiotics. I think they wanted to really to reach that 30 days mortality. If you have a sick, very sick patient, and at least that's where I where I stand. If you have a patient with pneumonia and you know that they, they're elderly, they are bed bound, they're not going to survive, but for the symptom control, I don't know, would you agree, Dr. Samson? I would give antibiotic just if, 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 if they can feel better. Yeah. If it, even even they are elderly, you know, hectic, bed bound, you know, just 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 maybe to ease off that. Uh, Unless you're going to give them rampant diarrhea with your antibiotics. So well, yeah, that dep depends uh, depends how they are. But that's you know th that's why the study I think didn't work out as they as as they and they admit that as well as they really wanted because you have the, this patient. Okay. Um, they're really sick. I don't think they will survive. OK, they're not for our study. But interestingly, if you look, that's that's why I said that when I, when I looked at the uh, side effects, non-fatal uh, effects and fatal effects, if you read actually the patient description, you know what we agree as a not not resuscitate or do not give a care or do not admit on intensive care in different parts of the world means different things. So there is a description of the patient who had advanced stomach cancer who was on intensive care and received the treatment, who was enrolled to this study. So I think that's not very, not very much specified. What for us here might be, you know, patient who's just acutely unwell and will go to intensive care. Uh, in the other, in the other side of the world, it might be just a standard patient that they admit. So I think that wasn't specified as well. That's a valid point. It's really, really difficult.
So I'm very sorry, I missed my original day to present on the arrest trial. So um, this is for the Journal Club for Arrest Trial, the advanced reperfusion strategies for patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and refractory ventricular fibrillation. It's a phase two single center, open label, randomized control trial, which was published in The Lancet in 2020. So the background information for the, the paper was that there's quite a poor outcome for patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and half of the patients with a VF out-of-hospital cardiac arrest end up in refractory VF, which in the paper they defined as a failure of at least three shocks with no ROSC, and this is associated with a worse prognosis for the patient. What they wanted to look at with this paper was the use of ECMO for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and that had only been looked at with observational cohort studies before with no randomized trials, and that the patients were requiring more than 40 minutes of cardiopulmonary um, uh, resuscitation are very unlikely to end up having ROSC. Um, and that 70 to 85% of all patients presenting with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and refractory VF have, have coronary artery disease. So to be included in the arrest trial, they had to be adults, um, somewhere from 18 to 75 years old. They had to have an initial out-of-hospital cardiac arrest rhythm of ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia. They, of course, had to not achieve ROSC after three shocks. Alex, your slides aren't going on. Your slides oh. aren't about. Oh, sorry, they're advancing on my screen. Um, are they? Are they moving we now? See, we can see the first slide. Okay. Maybe if I share this differently. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's better. Oh, that's better. Oh, oh okay. Um, so did, did it move there when I did that? Yeah, sometimes that's the only way with um, MS Teams, so you might yeah. just have to click through them that way. Yeah. Okay, I'll make it a little bit bigger. Um, so for in inclusion, uh, we already talked. To, um, sorry, inclusion criteria were adults, which they presumed to be 18 to 75 years old. They'd have initial out of heart hospital cardiac arrest rhythm of VF or pulseless ventricular tachycardia. They couldn't achieve ROSC after three defibrillation shocks, and they had to be able to fit in the Lucas device, and they had to have an estimated time to emergency department transfer of less than 30 minutes. And uh, this is the profile of the arrest trial. So there was 36 patients initially assessed for eligibility. Six were removed as ineligible, and 30 were enrolled and randomly assigned to one of the two branches. The two branches were ECMO-facilitated resuscitation with PCI or standard ACLS treatment. One of the 15 patients who was in the ECMO um, trial was refused to continue and participate on day three and was removed. So they ended up with 29 patients in the trial. Um, this is just the baseline characteristics of the intention to treat. It might be very small like this. Let's see. I don't know if I can make this bigger. Um, in the paper, they mentioned that the two populations are very similar, but the actual medication comorbidity seems quite different. But obviously, due to the very small size of the trial, the significance of that uh, wasn't apparent. This is a, a Kaplan-Meier plot showing the cumulative survival of patients from the two groups, which were up to six months after discharge. Um, at that point, uh, at the point of um, 105 days, they ended up canceling the trial due to the discrepancy between these two survival rates, but there was none surviving from the standard ACLS treatment and 40% of the ECMO group survived to at least six months post randomization. Obviously, with a trial like the arrest trial that is looking at a very small set of population in a single center, there are a number of limitations. One obviously is that it's a single center, but the center is very experienced, um, reporting multiple papers about ECMO and its use in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. 
Having such a short transport time is also another limitation. There's not many centers that can implement the less than 30 minutes from emergency services into PCI. Um, uh, refractory VF arrests are, are quite a rare um, presentation, so there was a very small number of patients. Now, one of the other issues was they, they, they did uh, cease the trial quite early, but it almost seemed predictable because the center had done uh, a non-randomized study at the same center, which had found almost the exact same numbers that they presented in the arrest trial. And if one patient had still survived in the ACLS group, the trial wouldn't have met its cessation targets and would have continued further. Obviously having um, ECMO and PCI in less than 30 minutes of uh, transport time, there's no cost analysis done, but it can be quite expensive. Despite all this, there was very encouraging results. I mean, you have uh, two groups of patients, one group with zero survival rate and one with 40%. And these are both uh, often very fatal uh, presentations. It was a very small experience center. So by doing these trials and, and being very interested in it, they were quite good at treating these patients. And it has also led to the inception trial, which is a larger study that's ongoing to look at the application of ECMO and PCI in refractory VF arrests in a larger setting and across multiple sensors. But it is a very small subset of patients all in the Minnesota area. And that could obviously be quite limited. But I mean, I think for our, our purposes, it seems like this could be a feasibility at the Glenfield Hospital site as both ECMO and PCI are available there. And that's, that's what I have for the rest of the trial. Is there any questions? Alex, it's it's Kaz. I can tell you that we do we do have an eCPR service. It's slightly in its infancy in Glenfield, but it's not actually currently for out of hospital cardiac arrests. It's for people that come in and then arrest in the cath lab, literally yeah. just because of the. But there are all sorts of problems. The first one of which is that VA ECMO, so cardiac ECMO, is not commissioned by NHS England. So the query is who pays for it. Um, and actually we've done, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, about five of them and one patient went on to have a heart transplant and all the others didn't do well. So it, that's quite an expensive, invasive thing for a 20%. But that was a young chap in his early 40s who came in, had a VF arrest in cath lab because of his LAD um, MI and has you know had a heart transplant and has gone back to looking after his young family so that's a good outcome but we had quite a lot of bad outcomes well i mean i think it's, it's quite hard with the study of, of a very very small subset of patients who are very very unwell and very unlikely to survive you know i think always the cost analysis is going to look quite bad if the intervention isn't almost free which ECMO isn't. No, no. Yeah. But it, it was quite interesting that, you know, the numbers are impressive in a small number of patients. Yeah, and I think when the other outcome is just death, it's more important, isn't it? It's like, it's either death or not death. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sam's got a comment. I think it's, um, in my opinion, it's the study in a way is um, without doing a study makes sense that an ECMO will improve mortality in this group of patients. Yeah. I think it's the whole package. So what the region is looking at is to have an out of hospital cardiac arrest centers because in some places if you're going to wait for 12 or 24 hours for your primary PCI that is what is going to contribute to your mortality because the resource council guidelines align their guidance with the European Society of Cardiology in terms of the need for immediate primary PCI and all out of hospital cardiac arrest without an identified no cardiac cause for it. So um, while I was 
surprised, and I can't remember, I just joined, but I've heard this paper about a week ago. I think having a zero survival out of 17 is a bit too, was it 17 in the other arm? I can't remember. It was so that's 15 in the other arm. 15 and 15 initially, then one withdrew from the ECMO group, so it was 14 and 15. Which is a bit too much for me, to be honest. I mean, in Glenfield, I, I can get you the figures, but I think roughly we, we have about, what, 40% survival without ECMO, isn't it, Kaz, roughly, or I don't know. But out of hospital cardiac arrest. Yeah. Well, the, the yeah. overall UK is 25. If, you, if, yeah. you, if you're if you alive by the time you get to ICU, yeah. only one in four of them get home to a neurological outcome that is independent living. So having zero out of 15 maybe is a bit... Would you have it, Alex? Would you have eCPR? <laughs> I, I would, but um, but the 15 in the ACLS group had to have had three shocks that didn't revert them as well. So they're not even that 25% that would normally survive because they're basically in refractory VF. Well, they are. Yeah. I mean, I think you would want something that, I mean, 40% is better than 0% by so much that it's, I don't know. But I guess it's just, as you said, it's very hard to be able to get a patient in. In 30 minutes, they have to have ECMO and PCI. And I, I don't know how many how many refractory VF patients we have in Leicester every year, but I would guess it's a very, very small number. It's hard. Oh, I'd, I'd be guessing, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's a handful, I would guess. It's not that many. The VF still... I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting paper. I think the inception trial will be very informative when we see what other centers can do with it as well.